Throughout judiciary and forensic history, most criminal activities such as homicidal cases has been unraveled by the two cornerstones of evidence, witness testimony and forensic findings. We often think that the current development of technology has made the identification of criminals or suspects much easier, and that the inclusion of DNA fingerprinting has basically eliminated the arduous process of crime scene investigations. However, in many cases, the existence of DNA in crime scenes does not imply a closed case. Today, we will look at a case which was once considered cold, even when DNA of the suspect was collected at the crime scene. Here is the case of Sarah Lynn Weinsky. Meet Sarah Lynn Weinsky, a homeless 49-year-old Caucasian female who was brutally strangled and raped on the 22nd of May of 2005, with her body found lying under a secluded wood deck overhang of a then Ronald McDonald house on the 702 8th Avenue Street at St. Petersburg, Florida. On that day, screams were heard around 11 p.m., but nobody saw the actual crime. Her body was discovered with signs of strangulation and rape, in which vaginal DNA samples were collected. Initial database matches showed that there were no matching suspects available. Since Sarah was a homeless person, she had relatively little connections and family. This case was considered cold after a short period of investigation. Before we move on to how the forensic scientists cracked the case, we must first learn how DNA matches is conducted in the US. The CODIS Combined DNA Index System is a US national DNA database created and maintained by the FBI to match newly acquired DNA collected from crime scenes or DNA data from cold cases. The mechanism of the DNA database is based on a unique feature on the non-coding part of the DNA named the short tandem repeats, or STR, on different loci of the human DNA. Instead of explaining the entire theory of STR, let me give you a real-life analogy. So to quickly explain it, you have to know that DNA is made out of four alphabet, uh, which represents the DNA code. So uh, we have A, T, C, and G. So, as an example, let's say that this is individual A, a person which, in different areas of his DNA, we can find different numbers of repeats. So, let's say this $5 coin equals AT, the AT code in his DNA, and the $2 coin representing A and C. So, as you can see here, in this individual, in one location of his DNA, there are four repeats of AT, whereas in another location of his DNA, there are six repeats in uh, loci 2, the second location. So we can compare it to, say, another person. So maybe this other person might have five repeats of AT in first location and only three repeats on the second location and these traits these numbers of repeats are inherited by their parents so uh, we use different low size to actually identify the DNA fingerprint of the person so as you can see individual A and individual B does not match up However, if we only had two low size, there might be the off chance that the number of repeats match due to chance alone. So in the US system, since there is a population of around 327 billion, in order to provide sufficient statistical power for identifying individuals, there are 13 core low size and 7 additional low size. However, one core caveat of the CODIS system is that only three indexes of DNA is used for investigational purposes, which are the offender index, arrestee index, and the forensic index containing profiles from the crime scene. So as you can see here, the DNA index is not inclusive to those who have not had former criminal records, which implies that given an individual is neither a former criminal or a suspect, he cannot be matched in the CODIS system. And with that in mind, 
we can finally reveal why Sarah's case was considered cold. So by the time police had collected enough information on any suspects by asking other homeless people, they had an initial suspicion towards Raymond A. Samuels, who was a transient which worked for a brief period in Florida. Raymond had already left Florida, leaving the case cold without further investigation. It was until 2006 when Raymond was arrested and incarcerated for another attempted murder and kidnapping that the DNA database matched the collected DNA from the rape to Raymond's DNA fingerprint. However, the DNA match alone only formed circumstantial evidence of sexual intercourse and did not incriminate Raymond of the rape and murder charges. In fact, Raymond's lawyer argued that he only have had consensual sex with Sarah which could very possibly be argued in favour of the suspect in court. Knowing that, forensic scientists then started to further investigate into the strangulation pattern and trace the DNA found on the location of strangulation from Sarah's corpse. Luckily, Raymond's DNA was also found on the scene of murder, alongside with the belt that was left that was used to strangle Sarah. With these direct incriminating evidence of murder, Raymond was finally charged with first-degree murder charges, alongside with charges involving rape. Given such, he has been extradited back to Florida, and is now currently incarcerated. So the more I learn about forensic science, the more that I know about the flaws and loopholes that many can exploit if they have been involved in certain crimes. So not only has this case study exposed a flaw in the current system, it has also proposed some parallels to current events in Hong Kong. In the Hong Kong DNA database, only volunteers, suspects, and criminals are required to submit their DNA for fingerprinting, which poses the same problem as the CODIS in US in the Sarah Lynn case. Have had Raymond not been incarcerated in Ohio, he would not have been incriminated with such strong justifications. This is further accentuated in current events in Hong Kong, where increasingly more deaths have been found to possibly be politically motivated and have had relatively few substantial evidence of their deaths. If DNA fingerprint collection had been mandatory, one could argue that it would be easier to determine the criminal. One ethical concern for DNA databases is that mandatory collection of DNA infringes on personal privacy if made mandatory, and that the establishment or law enforcement should not have the authority to make mandatory DNA collections. This balance in law enforcement, surveillance, and personal privacy is one hard discourse society has to take on the topic of forensic science. In this video, we have had a case study on Sarah Lynn Weinsky, which showed how forensic science and technology, such as DNA matching, is crucial towards homicide cases with minimal witnesses, a retrospective analysis on CODIS, and discussions of the limitations of DNA databases in both US and Hong Kong, and finally, a segue on the nature of DNA surveillance and personal privacy in the current state of affairs in both Hong Kong and US. Last but not least, I want to end this video on a quote by Weinsky's daughter, which I think depicts the importance of the impartiality of forensic scientists, and that forensic science aim to achieve is true equity and justice. She was not living a life to be proud of at the time of her death. As a family, we are not in denial about where she was in life. But it is important to us that people know that her life was not a waste and not something anyone had the right to take from her. She was not always homeless and alone. Thank you very much. This has been my video presentation on forensic science.